government? Well, the Fed is a hybrid, if you will. The Federal Reserve district banks are private institutions that remit the remaining profits that they generate, if there are any, after they cover their operating expenses, to the Federal Reserve in Washington. And the Federal Reserve in Washington then transmits any profits after it covers its operating expenses to the Treasury in the form of remittances. So the, the best way I can describe the Fed to the average American as, is that the 12 district uh, uh, the 12 districts email addresses end in .org, and those in Washington, D.C., like Janet Yellen, her email address ends in .gov. So it's, it's a private public institution. It's both. Okay, and, and who are the people running the Fed? I mean, who are they, what are they part of? Well, they're mainly part of academia. Who are they, what are they part of? They are, uh, and, and it didn't used to be that way. I don't mean to be flip, uh, but, but the people running the Fed are, are mainly PhDs in economics whose decision-making revolves around theoretical models. These theoretical models, is this just things where they're sitting, you know, in a, in a setting where they're just, you know, thinking about how they should approach the economy? I mean, are they out on the street? Are they looking at what's happening with the people? Are they really, do they have their ear to the ground of knowing what's really going on? Uh, no, I think that that's, I think that you're driving at the core of really what's gone wrong with the Fed is that there's not enough practicality and pragmatism within the institution. Um, if something that's going on in the real world doesn't happen to fit into one of their econometric models, then it's simply dismissed. And that goes a long way towards explaining why the Fed missed the financial crisis when a lot of people who did have their ear to the ground, myself being one of them, saw it coming. Is the Fed then working in the best interest of the American people? Well, no, that's kind of a rhetorical question, uh, and I would have to say no, that the Fed has not been acting in the best interest of the American people. Otherwise, you wouldn't have had now the second largest generation in the country, the baby boomers. Of course, the millennials are a, a larger generation population-wise, but you really wouldn't have, uh, have abandoned the retiree class in this country with the specter of zero interest rates had the Fed truly had their best interests in mind. So with all this currency printing or creation um, with QE, uh, the Fed buying up the toxic real estate from the banks, is the Fed actually working for Wall Street then? Well, I don't think anybody at the Fed would answer in the affirmative to that question, but that has been one of the, they would tell you unintended consequences is that Fed policy has unfairly benefited Wall Street um, and that it, it has unfairly detrimented the average American, i.e. Main Street. But I don't think that that's what they think that they were doing. But again, to go back, go, going back to your early observation, is their ear to the ground? No, I don't think it is. I think that they believe that the so-called wealth effect actually exists on planet Earth where it really doesn't. The wealth has not trickled down um, to every working American. So since 2008, since the, uh, the crisis that we had, the Great Recession, up until this point, which is uh, almost nine years later, has the economy actually improved after everything the Fed has done? Well, I think it's, it's fair to say that jobs have been created and that home prices have certainly risen and that asset prices like stocks and bonds have, have also risen in value, uh, has the economy itself improved? You know, if you look at economic growth from the time that we emerged from recession in 2009 until the just reported year and final 2016, gross domestic product has averaged 1.8%. So I would have to say, no, the economy really has not improved. We're not technically in recession the way it's defined, but improved, I think, is something of a stretch, given this is the most anemic economic growth we've seen in the post-World War II era. You talked about jobs, and there's a lot of individuals that look at the job numbers, and they're saying that these job numbers aren't really reflecting the actual uh, people 
at work because they're saying a lot of it went uh, a lot of jobs went from um, full-time to part-time a lot of people are out of the labor force but they still want a job and when trump was actually campaigning a lot of people looked at this and said you know you know he's right there's a lot of people out of work and and uh, people aren't working right now does the fed actually see this as a problem or do they feel that the labor market is strong Unfortunately, I think that they believe that the unemployment rate that is reported every month in the headlines is indicative of success on their part. Uh, but by the same token, I think that they recognize that the labor force participation rate, or the flip side of it is the employment to population ratio, is certainly not what would indicate a robust and strong jobs market, which is why they continue to keep interest rates as low as they are, hoping that this tool will help create more jobs. But this far into, again, a very anemic recovery, you would have to start to observe that they're using the wrong tool, that it is not, it, it, it is not and should not be the onus of the Federal Reserve to induce strong job recovery that, that produced strong wages and incomes. Now, the Fed has been talking about um, interest rates, uh, raising interest rates. They said last year they were going to raise interest rates, you know, maybe three times during the year. They only did it once. And now in 2017, they have said they're going to raise interest rates once again. From working with the Fed and seeing what's out there, do you believe that they will be raising interest rates three times this year? Well, they're going to have to get started when the market does not expect for them to get started. Um, they were a bit more dovish than the uh, than what was anticipated coming right out of the gate with their first statement on February the 1st. And so the market at that point reduced its expectations for rising interest rates at the upcoming March meeting. So the, the Federal Reserve only tends to raise interest rates if there's a press conference that follows the decision. That leaves them with four opportunities in 2017. Uh, they'll really have to change the, perce the perception of, a, a, of an interest rate increase in March in order to even begin fulfilling that commitment of three times. If they don't raise interest rates in March, that means that they'll have to raise at the, at the other three meetings where there's a press conference that follows which kind of backs them into a corner in the same spirit that they were backed into a corner in 2016 and had to renege on their hawkishness. The, the Fed is continually out there and they're, I, I mean, I see the, the minutes and they say that the economy is doing well. You've worked for the Fed and you saw what was coming up uh, in the 2008 crisis. When you look today, do you see that we're headed towards another crisis? I try and keep a positive look out, out, out there, outlook. Um, I would say that American banks are not as capital constrained or as weak as they were going into 2008 because there has been some repair that's gone on on those balance sheets. But by the same token, we don't know how interconnected we are on a global basis in the aftermath of all of this quantitative easing, other global banks blowing out their balance sheets in the same way that we have here at the Federal Reserve in the United States. And asset valuations are more stretched than they were, maybe not in residential real estate, but that's certainly the case in, in commercial real estate and in the bond market. And st the stock market is almost at its peak overvaluation levels as well. So will the financial crisis that's to come look the same as that which arrived in 08 and 09? Probably not. But that doesn't mean that there won't be a substantial amount of wealth lost going forward when these different and multiple bubbles do eventually implode under their own weight. I mean, you're, you're talking about bubbles and many times the Fed is out there and they, they say they don't see any bubbles whatsoever. So you actually see bubbles in, in the market, in real estate and maybe auto and student loans. Do, do you actually see bubbles? I mean, bubbles is a word that is just overused. Um, but if you look at, for example, consumer credit in the United States, because you just said auto loans and, and student loans. Mm-hmm. 
Right now, it's almost 20% of economic output, consumer credit, outside of mortgages. That's two percentage points above where it was at its former peak in 2008. So households are definitely more stretched than they have been. Again, maybe not in mortgages. But when you add up some of the default rates that we're seeing in FHA mortgages, which is really the only way for, um, for, but for, for households with stretched budgets to make low down payment, uh, um, down payments on mortgages and get into a home. If you look at the default rate there, about 4%. If you look at the default rate on student loans, about 11%. If you look at the default rate on subprime auto loans, about, um, uh, well, the, the losses are running at about 8%. Sorry, I don't have the, that default figure at the top of my head. But you are seeing stresses emanate from the household sector, which tells you that the size of the debt has grown to be um, has grown to be much too large. Bubbles, we usually talk about bubbles in asset classes. And is the bond market in a bubble? I would have to say that that's the case because of the $3 trillion in global losses suffered just in the few weeks that followed the election because the bond market took a step back. And you talked about debt. Um, I mean, right now the United States um, is in twenty trillion dollars worth of debt. Two hundred trillion of that's global. That's, that's global, the global, global debt global market. Debt. I mean, we have a lot of debt, and what I've seen in the past is that the tax revenue coming into the government has continually dropped. It's declining right now. If you look at state level, if you look at federal level, the tax revenues coming in are dropping. Can we sustain this debt right now? Well, we can sustain the debt as long as the rest of the world allows us to, is the long story short. What do you the mean? The U.S. By... dollar remains, well, the U.S. dollar remains the reserve currency, and that means that foreign countries will still have to continue to pony up at our auctions and support our debt. So mathematically speaking, unless you're talking about Armageddon, we can continue to support this debt. That being said, you're right. The budget does not work. And uh, towards the end of last year, we were put on notice as a country because our deficits started to rise as well. So if interest rates rise at any kind of an appreciable rate, the debt service of the country will quickly engulf the budget and we will have serious problems. And I worry about the ability to service the U.S. debt. I worry about the ability of corporations to service their record debt levels. If you look at non-financial corporations, and again, I go back to households as well, who have tacked on enormous amounts of debt over the past few years, and they could seriously not afford interest rates to rise against that backdrop. If we cannot service the debt, if that point ever comes, what do you see happening in the economy then? Well, these are, these are questions that are very difficult to answer, right? The last time something like this happened, China wasn't a global superpower, and you're talking about 1913, 14 and the years that led up to the Great Depression. That's what happens when countries can't service debt. You end up with currency wars and trade wars that follow, followed by war wars. And that's what happens. That's why there, 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 there's a tremendous amount of anger, which is one of the reasons I wrote the book, because the average American can't figure out why they can't get ahead. Well, they can't get ahead because... The culture inside the Federal Reserve has been one that has promoted debt creation at the, at, at the expense of long-lasting prosperity. And that's not something that can continue indefinitely without serious consequences. But I would never bring up the whole idea of war, as in warfare, uh, related to an economy if it wasn't that serious, but I think that it, it can become that serious over time, especially if other global economies uh, have to engage themselves to try and keep their economies afloat, which ends up creating tensions across global lines. Former Senator uh, Ron Paul and now Senator Rand Paul and other senators, they're pushing a bill to audit the Fed. And it seems like the Fed continually fights this. They don't want to be audited. What are they so afraid of? What are they worried about if they are audited? Well, I don't think that the Fed wants anybody to question the way that they make monetary policy. They're very protective of that. 
which is understandable. We need an independent central bank. I disagree with uh, the senators on the idea that we should end the Fed. I, I wouldn't want the banking system to run off into the sunset completely unregulated. Um, but I do think that there needs to be more of a check and balance on what has effectively become the fourth branch of the U.S. government, the Federal Reserve. And I think that the onus is upon Congress and the administration to put dissenting voices onto the Federal Reserve Board so that we don't necessarily have to come in and say, this is absolutely how you have to conduct yourself and you, you have to be a, you have to go by this or that rule in making monetary policy and be disciplined inside of a box. But I do think that if you had more people among Federal Reserve officials who were able to dissent and were able to disturb that culture of groupthink, that we wouldn't be in the situation that we were in today with people demanding an audit of the Fed. You have to go down to the studs and invite dissent onto the Federal Reserve Board. I think the opposite way. I think that it's the people of the country that should be involved and looking at what the Fed is doing. I know it's private, but I believe that the Fed as a private corporation gets away with a lot of things. And the people of the country, because before the Fed, uh, there was no Fed. It was the government creating currency. And now we have this debt-based model, which looks like it can't go any further. And at the at this time, I don't see the purpose in the Fed. I don't see what benefit it gives to the people because they're actually loaning currency out to the public with interest. And the people then, they have to pay for this in the long run with taxes. And actually, if you look at the debt load in the country, there's really no way to pay this back at all. No, there's not. And you're right that the Fed has stopped working for the people of the country. But that doesn't mean that the institution needs to go away. The word that I use means it is upend. I don't think we need a thousand PhD economists at the Federal Reserve all coming up with the same conclusion, looking at the same data. I think that the budget, in terms of the research budget at the Fed needs to be slashed, and that the budget in terms of supervising the banks needs to be greatly increased so that we can stay one step ahead of those on Wall Street who are creating securities and assets that make their, specifically to get around the regulators and stay one step in front of the Fed. I think we need to have the smartest people at the table and have people who have been on the receiving end of Fed policy to make sure that Fed policy is designed for the people at the Federal Reserve. You have to start at the very foundations and put, make sure that if the Federal Reserve cooks up a concoction, that they actually have to taste their cooking and eat it themselves before passing it out on the menu to everybody else. Yeah, because when I, I look around the world, I mean, this is what I see. This is, and many people who listen to what I uh, report and, and what I talk about is, the Fed around the world, not, not just here in the United States, but the ECB, the IMF, uh, the central bank systems, we look around Europe, I mean, they have a huge amount of uh, high, very high unemployment. Most of the countries are in debt. They're at negative interest rates, and they're continually purchasing uh, corporate bonds. They're, pur you know, they're monetizing the debt. The same thing in the United States. They're monetizing the debt. They're buying treasuries. And... Right now, over this period of time, it seems like the system has completely broken down. And right now, the people at, at the bottom, they are completely suffering through all of this. And it doesn't seem like it's getting better as they continue on with their policies. Well, I would push back a bit. I would say that the people at the very bottom are doing okay. We've had one of the quietest expansions of the social safety net since FDR was in office. I would say the people right above them are suffering the most. The people who get up every day and go to work and pay their taxes and stretch themselves to pay property taxes to cover underfunded pensions that have been corrupted and cannot put food on the table and are forced to take out a subprime auto loan in order to 
to get back and forth to work, to stretch that payment amount. I would say it's the, it's the rung right above who are being hollowed out and being disserviced the most by Federal Reserve policy. It's those who want to continue to give that have been destroyed to the greatest degree and who are arguably really angry and deservedly so. Yes, I, I do agree with you on that, that it is, well, the middle class is kind of disappearing, but I mean, if the bottom rung, if we took away all those sh social programs, food stamp, because food stamps, the number of people on food stamps have, have gone up dramatically. If the government couldn't pay for that anymore, it would be pretty much almost everyone except for the very wealthy that would be suffering right now. Uh, since Trump has become president, do you think he's going to approach the Fed and end the Fed? Well, I don't think he's going to end it. I mean, he's he's got a lot of things he wants to spend money on, um, last I checked. And for that, you need somebody controlling the levers of interest rates. So when people ask me about Trump, um, my stock answer is I hope he introduces the essential changes that are needed inside the institution. He has an immediate opportunity, an enormous an opportunity, because there are two vacancies on the Federal Reserve Board. So he's got it in him. He's got the power right now to put two dissenting voices on the Federal Reserve Board. I'll dig into the weeds for just a bit, a bit with you. Last September, Janet Yellen was staring down the barrel of a double dissent on the Federal Reserve Board. Tarullo and Brainerd were very vocally threatening to dissent something that's only happened on the Federal Reserve Board twice in the last 21 years. So rather than withstand that, she took a triple dissent from three district bank presidents who were stepping down from their voting rotation in December. Yellen does not want people on her inner, in, within her inner sanctum to say no, and Trump has an immediate opportunity to put people on the Federal Reserve Board who will push back and who will say no immediately. And then you will see other people follow. Janet Yellen's term is over in less than a year. I think Daniel Tarullo would follow if a check and balance was placed in where, where he is. I think Brainerd would leave as well. And Stanley Fisher's term is due up, the vice chair of the Federal Reserve Board in June. You're talking about six of the seven seats on the Federal Reserve Board that are there for the picking for President Trump to fill and completely revolutionize and change the face of that organization. So, I, I mean, I said end the Fed. What happens if he decides to get rid of the private part, uh, not part, but the, the privacy of the Fed to open it up and the government actually take control of the Fed? Do you think he'll make that move? Well, I, I hope he's a wise enough soul to understand the last thing we need is a bunch of politicians running the Fed. The Fed's become overly political as it is. I wouldn't want Congress running it, not on behalf of my children. Okay, He's because I, obviously, I mean, I, it, then a voice of independence and reason, bringing in complete outsiders. So I would hope that he would not invite the fox into the hen house of the Fed. I mean, I mean, I differ in that because the Constitution, when it was created, and and when we look at you know coining money, there there was no Fed. I mean, Andrew Jackson ran on the platform of removing the, the, I think it was the second bank of America. It was a central type of bank at that time. And I, I think we've come to this point in time in our country where many things need to change. And personally, I think one of them is the, the central bank, which is the Fed, where it needs to have a complete overhaul or actually just completely remove it. Because I really still do not see a benefit of a private corporation creating currency out of thin air and attaching interest on it and loaning it to the government where it then filters down to the people and puts people into further and further debt. Well, I think we're agreeing to disagree here because you're talking yeah. about the way the Fed operates today as being broken. And in that sense, I would say absolutely. It needs to be fixed. It needs to be re-engineered. It needs to be recreated. You need to go down to the studs. So in, in that, we agree. If we got rid of our central bank, I think China would throw a huge party because they know that our financial system is global. And if we had anarchy inside of our banking system, then they would be that one step closer to having their currency be the reserve currency 
and overtaking our economy and becoming the largest economy in the world. We have to understand that we are interconnected in our global financial system and that that, that is not a bell you can unring, which means you have to be in it to win it. And again, I say it one more time, take the Federal Reserve down to the studs. We are not a country anymore that we were in 1913. You don't need to have all of the decision-making centralized in New York and in Washington. You need to decentralize it and put the powers inside of the districts where we have economic growth and make sure that every Federal Reserve district president is has a permanent vote going forward Again, so you distill that power base that has become so politicized in Washington, D.C. Daniel, you mentioned the, um, the, the dollar being the reserve currency. There are many out there calling for a different reserve currency where they're saying maybe the SDR. Um, we see problems in the Middle East where we had the petrodollar, where these countries were using the dollar to pay for uh, oil purchases. And that seems to be eroding away right now. And we see right now that there are many out there saying that, yeah, the dollar, it's not going to be the reserve currency anymore, that there is there are replacements that are ready to take over. Uh, do, do you see that at all? Well, given the debt load of the country, I think if there was a viable alternative, we would already be there. Um, but the infrastructure to have some kind of a uh, of a hybrid or a basket of currencies, replace it, or a Bitcoin coin, for example, replace it. We simply don't have a payment system in place globally that would withstand that. If we did, I think we would be much more vulnerable. If we go out 10 years from now and don't enact the changes that are required, I think China steps into that breach and replaces the dollar. And then we're, in, then we're truly in the soup. What are we going to do with our... What are we going to tell our grandchildren then? Yeah, I mean, everything would completely change and our way of life will completely change at that point. And what we're seeing, I mean, you you mentioned China because China and Russia, they have almost kind of duplicated everything here in the United States. They created a payment system. They created very similar markets, the gold exchange, the Shanghai Gold Exchange. And it looks like they're kind of duplicating what we have here maybe to set up um, a them or, you know, China or Russia or whatever to be the reserve currency of the world. I don't know if you, I don't know if you see that or you heard about. Well, I, I think that the groundwork has been laid, but again, China's got all of 4% of the global payment system. Um, on a practical level, it doesn't work. But over time, again, these are not changes that I'm talking about needing to be made over the next eight years. I think these are immediate changes that have to be affected immediately because as you mentioned, they've at least followed us in principle, if not in practice and laid the groundwork for them to one day take over. And the longer we wait, the more, more vulnerable we become to that becoming an eventuality. Neither of them have strong enough banking systems, resources or economies to take over the United States at this point. It's just not a, it, 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 it's not a reality that, that, that can come to pass anytime soon. China's banking system is largely known to be insolvent and the corruption in Russia is, prevents them from being a true viable alternative. But again, you never know what tomorrow holds if the anger that is at the core of the global inequality divide continues to simmer and is left unchecked. And I go back to what I said earlier. You, you begin to lay the foundations um, for world war because that's what happens when economic strife is allowed to continue to fester under the surface and the anger continues to build, not just among Americans who were called the deplorables, but among the world, quote unquote, the deplorables who work hard every day. I, I, I hate to look into the future and see that as a possibility, but to your point, all four of my children have been taking Mandarin since they were four years old. The best defense is a good